You're listening to Paris Talks Marketing. My goal with this podcast is to dig deeper into digital marketing success than any other marketing podcast out there, to reveal the growth marketing strategies and tactics that are working today, empowering growth at amazing companies and organizations. Keep listening as I interview founders, CEOs, and marketing leaders from all around the world, primarily from companies in the tech and software as a service industry. Now, on with the episode. Go here. All right. Hi, everybody. We're live today with Rob Lowenthal. And Rob is the founder and CEO of Wooshka. Wooshka was established to give independent creators, publishers, broadcasters, and brands a modern, cost-effective, end-to-end platform to host, distribute, monetize, and track on-demand audio. Wooshka launched in early 2016 when audio hosting and podcasting technology was stuck somewhere in the late 90s. Rapid improvements in technologies such as artificial intelligence were presenting opportunities that audio creators were missing out on. Wooshka is now used by over 9,000 creators from independent podcasters to multinational businesses. Rob is the former managing director of McGuire Radio Network LTD and currently serves as the non-executive chairman of GTN Limited. Rob, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. Sure. So Rob, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself and Wooshka to our audience? Yeah, definitely. And look, um, I used to work in the radio industry a long time ago and I remember being there noticing that podcasting was taking off and I thought I've got to do something about this. And at the time it was still complex. I remember thinking that um, it was difficult to find analytics for your podcast. I used to ask my digital manager, in fact, how did we go last month with our podcast? And he would answer me in terabytes. And he would say, I think we did, you know, 50 terabytes. And then he would divide by those uh, terabytes by the average length of an episode, which is about 30 megabytes, and try and calculate how many people were listening. So um, I remember leaving that business thinking there must be something done uh, with technology to make life easier for podcasters. And that's why I started Wooshka. Awesome. I was doing some research uh, prior to, to this. And let me see if I can share my screen here. It looks like uh, I can't share my screen, but I was looking at Google Trends and I put in the term podcasting. And I look back five years and uh, basically I'll, I'll share the screenshot with you later, but we, we've got a pretty steady demand. And then somewhere around March of this year, no surprise, big spike. And then it spiked from March for several months and it's maintained a level that looks to be about two times higher in terms of overall worldwide search demand, about two times higher than that baseline for the past, say, four years. And that's the term podcasting. And this is telling me that, that many more people are jumping into podcasting, especially in the last, say, eight months. Maybe that's because of the world, how the world has changed this year. But what do you have any, any theory as to why podcasting has grown so much this year in popularity? That's really interesting. I, I'm surprised that it's grown that much. Um, obviously, I think that there's more content being produced around about the, the pandemic and elections and also like it's been a big news year and I think a lot of independent podcasters are finding their voice finally. Um, look, if you, if you were talking about 2014 and you would see the same jump, it was because Apple introduced a non-deletable app in every phone they sold around the world back then and that was the very uh-huh. first big jump in podcasting globally. But, yeah, I'm surprised to hear it's gone up so much this year. But, uh Look, interesting, good good news for people in the podcast industry, I think. There's a lot more interest. Yeah. I can share a little bit of my experience with, with you because I just got into podcasting literally about a month and a half ago, and I'm still learning and making some mistakes here. But for me as an agency, I always struggled with blogging consistently. And we were doing content marketing for so many clients, and we were never really good at doing it ourselves. And I always had a hard time just sitting down and getting myself to write content. And recently getting into podcasting, I feel like it's such of a more natural way for me to communicate because I spend most of my day talking. I talk to people in meetings. I talk to clients. We have internal meetings. And it's such a more natural way for me to communicate and to share my ideas and my expertise in digital marketing. And 
Do you think that there are people like me that also could, in a way, leapfrog uh, the, the whole blogging thing and just go straight to, to podcasting as a way to, yeah. to get our message out? Look, it's so much more natural. For hundreds of thousands of years, the human race has not been writing blogs. They've been speaking to one another in communities, and it just comes so much more naturally. And we often talk about people from two distinct age groups. When it comes, when we talk about connected home devices, Alexa and Google Home, young kids and older people, it's much more natural for them to ask for content. Not to sit down and type it up, but to say, hey, give me something. I want some information. And to talk to a device, it seems more natural to do that than actually look down at your hands and type on a keyboard. So what you've described there, I think, is quite natural. I think that you're you're not, uh, you, you know, there are more people out there who think exactly the same way that you do. And it's, you know, when, you, when you're writing, sometimes you're struggling to find those words. Whatever the words are that describe your emotion, because you don't have the power to, to change the tone of your voice. You can't look at someone, or in audio, you, you can't look at someone, but you can't change your tone and your mannerism to convey emotion or definition uh, as easily in writing as you can with audio. And I think that's why we're seeing people learning to communicate um, you know, in the podcasting medium now, uh, more so uh, in, in terms of growth and than the blogging world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was recently tr- working on a landing page and I got it, it's I'm still working on it two weeks later and I've been through several rounds of writer's block and I just get stuck and it's just so much more natural for me to have a conversation. Um, yeah. yeah, excellent. So for someone like me, Rob, who finally took the plunge, how would you what advice would you give to people who are on the edge and have been thinking about starting a podcast for a long time? And they need to take the plunge the way I did recently. What what advice would you give for getting started? Yeah, I think that what the, you know the key things are m- making sure you have great content. A lot of people start a podcast and all they want to do is focus on how we're going to get more listeners, but they forget that the most important thing you can do is actually make good content that people want to listen to when they eventually find you. So focus on the content. Don't go on for too long when you start a podcast. Don't go on for hours. You know, you're not Joe Rogan. Don't go for three hours. Try and start a little bit shorter and over time extend your listening. Um, Identify who your listeners are and get feedback directly from them. Go and find a way to speak to your listeners. Build up a mailing uh, database and then get in contact with your listeners as often as you possibly can and ask them for feedback on your content. That's what I always suggest in the early days for a podcaster to do, just as you would recommend to your clients who are in the SaaS industry or whatever it is that they do, hey, talk to your customers. You you talk to your customers and get feedback about your product. Go narrow and talk to your customers and keep iterating. And the same principle applies for podcasting. Start out, try and go narrow, um, focus on your area of expertise and talk to your listeners as often as possible. You grow that audience over time, potentially increase the length of your podcast, and then uh, finally you can find ways to expand your audience. Great. I'm also doing a lot of experimentation with promoting my podcast. And prior to the podcast, I had gotten some traction on LinkedIn, and I was publishing short videos. I think also that's how maybe you you found me, Rob. I was posting short videos like a, a vlog in a way almost every day on LinkedIn, and I thought that was a natural place to promote. And I'm still mostly focused on promoting now my podcast episodes through LinkedIn. And in fact, I really love the Wooshka feature where you can create a little video um, audio. It's an audio graph, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And that is a great little nugget. That's a great nugget for sharing on social media. But do you have any other advice um, other than social media sharing for promoting your podcast and trying to get traction? Yeah, look, often if you're interviewing uh, some sort of a guest, ask them to share it as well, the content, mm-hmm. because then you've ex- extended your reach to their audience as well on, on their social channels. But, you know, we have stumbled across a really interesting um, technique more recently. We've noticed that some podcasters are using private podcast functionality, which means you get to, via Wushka, you get to invite a listener directly. Um, and then they subscribe privately to the content and so on. But so, so you go go to a place like LinkedIn, identify who your target um, listener base is. You know, maybe they're, they're managers in the marketing industry in a certain part of Europe. Um, get, get that list of contacts, um, put them into your uh, CRM solution um, 
and then also upload those contact email addresses into Wooshka and invite them directly to listen to the content. Now, you might get sort of one in 100 people accept that invitation. But if you do that, you know, um, you know, 20, 30, 50 times, suddenly you're going to start building up an audience in your target demographic. This is only a new concept we've seen because private podcasting has only been a feature on Wooshka for about 12 months now. But I'm very interesting in, interested in seeing how that um, develops in coming months because we think it has application for businesses and sales teams where you might be trying to find a list of potential customers so you go in and get them from Seamless or LinkedIn, whatever you're using, and then target them with a podcast that is absolutely made for that customer that is somehow positioning you as a thought leader in your industry. And then you may, you may actually develop a fan before they're a customer. So that's something new and unique that I've seen done recently. But otherwise, I think people in podcasting always forget the power of finding out who your listeners are. So, so with unfortunately, with podcasting, you don't get individual email addresses from every one of your listeners. They come in through Apple or Spotify or wherever it is. So therefore, you can't write to them and communicate with them and remind them, hey, my next episode's coming up now, uh, other than through a, uh, a push notification when you release your episode in that app. So I think anything you can do to encourage them to go to your site and get their details, then you can start building up an offline relationship with those listeners. Um, there are a few of the sort of different ones. I mean, if you go and listen to all these podcast experts and consultants, they'll tell you, oh, I'll tell everyone to leave you a five-star review in Apple and blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. But I'm yet to hear any of those consultants come up with some really interesting uh, technical um, tricks to, to get um, to grow your audience. And what I've sort of mentioned there, just a couple of examples. And look, I, I, I first stumbled across you because I I felt I found your content you know, on LinkedIn and I think it's fantastic. And I'm running a SaaS company and I'm always trying to find ways to expand uh, and grow my, you know, we, we follow the sort of product-led growth playbook where we can. Um, so I'm always looking for information on how to put the product out there and let people sort of find out more information about the product and, you know, hopefully the leads develop as a result of our sort of content plan and so on. But I think that there can be more targeted ways when it comes to podcasting and just trying to get the individualized data of your listeners and then have, have a conversation with them directly. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's pivot now into, into how Wooshka does marketing. I'm very curious. Uh, you did mention I, that uh, a lot of it is just get it, making it available. Uh, I'll describe my process when I was researching different platforms. I went to Google and I searched for best podcasting software or podcast hosting software. And most of what's ranking on the first page of Google are lists. There are articles with various lists. And the first one had a 31 different podcasting hosting solutions. There's Anchor FM and there's Buzzsprout and, and Podbean and there's a bunch of others. And I found myself in this endless loop almost of just looking at them and thinking, God, they all look the same. And um, how do I make this choice? So my first question here is how, if that is a process that I imagine a lot of people getting into podcasting are doing, is trying to find that hosting platform as a, one of the first steps and stumbling into these list articles. How do you stand out? How do you differentiate Wooshka as a platform? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, in many ways, we're differentiating ourselves from not appearing in those top 30 lists and try, you know, these frustrating lists that are only built for, you know, SEO or whatever it is, or the guys who make them are looking for a cut from the podcast company. And it, it all... That, that yeah, they're whole, affiliates they're, most likely. They're always affiliate links and stuff. That, it just seems so lame to me. Like I just don't want to play in that space so much. Like what, what we want to do is put forward just a great product and encourage as much word of mouth as is possible. You know, occasionally I do interviews like this. Sometimes I'll, um, I present at conferences like marketing conferences or communications events and stuff like that. But I just kind of find it hard to get hung up on those, those sort of uh, online lists. Um, you know, more recently because of coronavirus has meant that there's not so much travel you can do. So I find myself presenting at some sort of a conference every week. Um, and so I can't fly around the world and, and present in person and shake someone's hand, but I've, I've, you know, I've, I've more than quadrupled the number of events I can attend and participate in. And I think that they're a positive way of gaining, you know, getting your brand out there. Um, our focus also is more towards the, the higher end enterprise sort of customer. 
So mm -hmm. an example, Atlassian are a big enterprise customer of Wooshka's and they use us predominantly for private podcasting, which means that they're sharing content internally to, to employees about uh, all sorts of matters, information, communication, sales updates, you name it. And I, I, I love working in that space with, with those podcasters who value a platform that has well, we've got a SOC 2 certificate, you know, we've penetration tests occasionally and then there's all of the other sort of security features that we add on and customer support and success. We're trying to provide podcast hosting um, in the same way that you, you um, have other large enterprise uh, pod, uh, technology contracts and, and that's working for us. You know, that's like we've got a lot of big companies around the world now who are using us but predominantly for internal content. So we've really mm -hmm. developed a strong reputation in that space over the last 18 months and we keep just working hard on that. So that therefore means that a lot of our marketing is focused on enterprise and not so much on uh, hobbyists and uh, independent podcasters anymore. I see. So a large company like Atlassian, could they could they use Wushka in conjunction with their learning management software or is there any connection between the other types of platforms like an intranet or an LMS that a company might be using? Can they plug Wushka into that? Yeah, often people are able to, so we integrate with whatever their single sign-on uh, product is, Okta or, you know, Micro, whatever they're using. Um, uh -huh. There's also pretty easy uh, capability for embedding content into those platforms. We're actually currently working on a native integration with Confluence, which is one of their key communications platforms. Um, and when we've started to look at ways we can partner with the, some of the, the larger um, intranet type providers because we think that what we provide or would complement some of their intranet, um, you know, just making it easier to integrate a podcast player, you know, into some of those intranets. When you get in and talk to these companies, you find out how they share audio and even video. It, it is archaic. Mm -hmm. Like they're trying to, the, the, you know, you're a listener and you like listening on your favorite podcast app because it plays when you walk away and it remembers where you stop listening. All the, all the features we don't need to go into because people get it. But when you're, companies don't actually, they don't think about that end user experience at all. They're sharing MP3 files in emails. They're, they're, you're trying to embed an MP3 file in a web page that sort of um, goes to sleep after 60 seconds. They're doing all this sort of stuff with absolutely no interest in the, in the end user. So when we go in and talk to these companies and show them, have you ever thought about, you know, we, we talk about an audio strategy and often they think an audio strategy means should I buy AM or FM radio ads? We say, no, an audio strategy means you've got to now take seriously connected home devices, podcasting, where are your transcripts? What are you doing with text-to-speech? You know, sometimes we've, we've got one client, they're called Toyota Material Handlings Group and they're a forklift company, global forklift business. And obviously their employees can't, they can't read the company blog when they're working or watch the video, but they can listen to a podcast. You know, so, so these companies need to have better tools for remote communication and that's where we come in and we even sort of say to them, you can convert that. We use Amazon Polly is embedded in our platform and you can convert text to speech quite easily in many languages and accents. And now they're starting to do it and now these employees are actually a little bit more engaged and informed as a result of that company having a more sophisticated enterprise audio strategy. So, so mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy um, talking to those companies and being in that space. And I think that that really sets us apart from the other podcast hosts. You know, I, I always say those guys, they're kind of, their dream is to one day work with Joe Rogan. It was my dream. It's my dream one day to, to host private content for Walmart. You know, it's, it's just a different, mm -hmm. I, I think that the opportunity is far greater at enterprise than it is working with, with independence. So that's why, you know, our marketing is more traditional SaaS based. You know, it's like pro product marketing, how, how can we get content out there, trying to position our tech mm -hmm. as being very secure and enterprise ready. Um, and that, that's been our, that's been our approach. We, we're still mm -hmm. learning every day as we go. You know, I still make all the mistakes. Yeah. Well, just asking a big company, what is your audio strategy? That itself is such an intriguing question because I imagine most people wouldn't even know how to, how to answer that. They probably would say, what, what do you mean? What is my audio strategy? But I think it's fascinating that this is an overlooked medium to reach your employees. Yes. And to reach them through channels that they now prefer because they are more and more listening to podcasts themselves. Or as you said, they're not always able to look at a computer screen or watch a video. 
but they might be out in the field or out on the move or just when they're commuting to and from work, you can communicate with them and, and, uh, and strengthen that relationship with uh, employees. Oh, yeah. So to me, that's a really a fascinating, that's a fascinating niche that, uh, that you're playing in. Definitely. The, the, look, we, all the surveys will show you that, I don't know, 50% of Americans listen to podcasts every month or something like that. If you look at some deeper surveys, neurological sur- surveys, um, podcasting or audio alone is, tw- is, is better. At, you, your, your memory encodes it twice as good as video and audio because you must use the theater of your imagination when you're listening to content mm-hmm. and therefore you encode it, you, you remember it better. So when we talk to people, we talk about high levels of engagement and audio is, is great at that, clearly. And it's just a mobile medium. So it means you can get up and go mm-hmm. for a walk and listen to stuff. Um, so yeah. when I talk about audio strategy, it's like sometimes you're introducing people to a problem they didn't know they had. And you say, and when you start talking about the opportunity right there, their problem is that they're not doing anything about the opportunity. And, and that's how we approach that, that pitch project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love this concept of the theater of the imagination. When I first heard you on on Omer Khan's podcast, it was, I don't know, probably six weeks ago, and I was out at a, a horse riding place, basically a horse stables with my daughter and, and wife, and, and, I, and I came across this term because you mentioned it on his podcast, and it stuck with me because I imagined you, and I hadn't seen your face yet, but I imagined you on a stage in a theater, yeah. and that image has stuck with me, and now I, it just... I just evoked it again just now when you when you said it, and I think it's so true that when you when you have to use your imagination when you have only audio as an input, and you're forced to use your imagination, then it does make sense that that get it gets encoded more into the memory. Oh yeah, and it's a, it's a higher quality experience. Isn't that the amazing thing about podcasting? There you are on the other side of the world. I'm in Sydney, Australia, and you're in Bulgaria in a horse stable, and you're listening to my content. You know, it blows me away every time yeah. I hear a story like that. It just reminds me about how wonderful this medium is. Um, and it changed my life. Like just, it's brain food. You know, I, I just can't get enough of this brain food. I, when I was in traditional media, I felt like I was going backwards in terms of my uh, knowledge and I was sort of, you get sort of dragged down into the just day in, day out media coverage of whatever election's going on at the time. But with podcasts, you can actively seek out content that makes you smarter every day. And that's that's pretty mm-hmm. special. Yeah. So, Rob, I want to ask you some questions about the, the marketing, and I know that the enterprise is more of the direction you seem to be headed in. But on the smaller <clears throat> or the, the podcast hobbyists like me, do you, do you calculate things like lifetime value and do you try to understand what you can afford to pay to acquire a new customer? We occasionally think about lifetime value. We don't put too much emphasis on the value of sort of nearly buying a customer in that way. Um, mm-hmm. We're still at a stage of our development where we just want to put it out there and it's more brand awareness, it's more um, positioning ourselves as experts or subject matter experts in this field and then and then allowing for a system to come in, um, to leads to come into our funnel. We're not in the sort of game yet of going out and trying to buy business. You know, we do a bit of... Um, a bit of SEO and a, you know a few other things out there, but our budgets aren't significant in that space. For us, it's to try and create um, you know this kind of word of mouth. We do have a, a very new affiliate partnership program. You know, we've got a few different partners who make who recommend us to their client base, and I think mm-hmm. we'll get more and more of that with uh, companies who are in the space that we're targeting. And right now, we're targeting um, enterprise internal communications and HR teams. Because they are the two places where um, they need a communication strategy, um, and all too often the podcasters are all going after the chief marketing officer, and because mm-hmm. and the, she's got the, the she, he or she has the budget, you go. They're also in very high demand, and they don't really give you much time. When you go knocking on the door of the HR manager or the internal communications team, they often have the time to sit down and speak with you and the budget to actually go out and fix a problem. So mm-hmm. we're really enjoying that approach at the moment. But no, we haven't um, gotten into the business really of kind of buying new business in, in that way. Mm-hmm. So no paid advertising on Google ads, Facebook ads, and LinkedIn ads in those places? A little bit on Google. But Facebook, we actually we buy some advertising on Facebook for um, campaigns. So occasionally, advertisers approach Wooshka and they want to run ads. 
and and they want to run ads in podcasts that are hosted by us. So so we act as a, an ad network, a broker for those podcasters, and occasionally we run a campaign. And as part of that, we we do some market research for the brand about effectiveness of the campaign. So we'll do that sort of Facebook targeting of listeners to a certain podcast and get them to fill in surveys about brand recollection and all that stuff. Um, so that's when we use sort of Facebook paid um, marketing, but that's always with a very different part of the business in mind, not so much for our SaaS. I got you. So an HR, an HR manager, I, I imagine that they, they don't think about podcasting as a solution for engaging their employees. They probably think more traditionally around company intranet or a learning management system. Um, how do you get the brand or how do you even get the concept in front of an HR manager who's looking for something maybe in an adjacent space like an LMS? How do you get them to really think about, as you said earlier, what is your audio strategy? How do you start that conversation with someone? On a, off, there are a number of techniques. Often it's I give a presentation or a speech just like this interview where I talk about some of the problems and, and the ways that people can solve them. And I'll do that in a, a at a conference. Um, I do it among uh, smaller groups. So I'm out there. It's not really a strategy that I'm, I can roll out at scale, but it's just something that we're doing at the moment. Um, we do have uh, you know a CRM, HubSpot, which we use to target different um, HR managers in different companies to find out, you know, we, we get their details and we write to them and we have email sequences that hopefully can can turn into leads or even encourage them to watch our webinar and download our white paper, you know, all the stuff that you'd be familiar with. So there are some of the basic techniques, but I still don't think we've cracked it yet. I think that we've mm-hmm. got a long way to go in our marketing efforts and how can we really appeal to these department heads at scale? Um, and we're, mm-hmm. we're still working on that. We're still struggling with it. Mm-hmm. Rob, what are some, can you talk to me about any mistakes that you may have made in the past that you've learned from as a business and how you overcame that? Yeah, for sure. Look, when I launched Wushka, I really thought that my commercial model would be one that was podcasters want to make money through advertising. And instead of charging them for my software, I'll actually just run a YouTube style of model where I um, where I offset their cost and make money out of a revenue share arrangement with advertisers. But I learned very quickly that podcasters are extremely protective of their audiences and they don't want just any ad going in their content. And many of them have small audiences and would, you know, they make they don't want to make 50 cents a month to run ads um, based on the CPMs that would be quite low. So it, it, we still have an ad network and it still does really well locally here in Australia. But my big first mistake was not just going really hard and deep into the um, charging a license fee for our software. You know, I should have done that. I should have done that much earlier, uh, and we we've learned that. I, I feel like I make mistakes on a daily basis. Um, I still don't think that we're doing everything we can do in the marketing side of our, our, our business. I think that we should be driving more leads into our business with, with better automation and um, you know identifying opportunities. I think that we, you know, from a from an, a platform point of view, we I believe we have the best technology solution in the world from for podcast hosting. But I don't think I've done a good job at actually telling the world about how good it is. You know, like you said earlier, you initially found Buzzsprout or some other thing, and you didn't really find Wushka. I mean, I, I I should have found a way for Wushka to be at the top of those lists a long time ago. But I've sort of I'm in a position where I'm sort of avoiding that now. But so we, I, I make so many mistakes, but the one thing that I made, you know, I'd have done right was picking an industry where the tailwinds are strong. So you can keep making mistakes, mm-hmm. falling forward and getting up and, and going again in an industry like this. Uh, had I have still been working at a radio station and making the mistakes that I'm currently making, I can assure you that I would have been let go a long time, long time back. So, um, and I'm the owner of my business too, so that helps. I can't sack myself. <laughs> Great. Excellent. So, Rob, is there is there anything that that keeps you up at night with the business? Yeah, I, I look. I worry that I'm not. Um, my pipeline's not big enough of, of deals coming into Christmas. I worry about um, you know a bug that we found in our. You know, I still look at tickets in the help desk every day. I can't I can't turn off, and I think about this business that when I wake up and when I go to bed, and that's just generally um, indicative of the founder's journey. 
Um, so the, the, the things that keep me up are also, am, am I going to miss out on the opportunities? Like we're well positioned to take advantage of any big opportunity and I'm probably more worried that I'm going to miss out on some of those and not act fast enough. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's just this kind of one constant, um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm the chief worry officer. That's what I do. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I'm in the same boat a lot of times. Yeah. So, Rob, what what gets you out of bed in the morning? What is the the, the thing that motivates you most? Oh, yeah, without a doubt, I've got a young family. Uh, my wife and four kids, aged between eighteen and nine. Um, they're, they're my you know, motivation and inspiration, and that's why I kind of do what I do every day. And all my happiness is derived from them. And then, and, and a little bit of extra happiness comes from my work. But uh, without them, uh, n- nothing much would be important. So certainly that. And then, you know, if I have any spare time, I like surfing and playing golf and doing fun stuff like that. Cool. Excellent. Well, Rob, I think we could we can wrap it up there. That's a great place to end it. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. I've been a huge fan of using Wooshka over the last several weeks, and I've told a lot of people about it. I'm having a lot of fun with it and with podcasting in general. So it's been really it's been really an honor and a thrill to have you on and and thanks very much. Thank you Paris, thanks for having me and I look forward to kind of can enjoying your wisdom on LinkedIn and in your podcast. I you know I'm a big fan so I I'm excited to be on your podcast and congratulations on your success too. Thanks very much. I'm going to keep that going and and uh, I really appreciate the feedback. Great. Thanks mate. Another great episode in the books. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get notified when future episodes drop, be sure to subscribe to Paris Talks Marketing on your favorite podcast player. And to learn more about SaaS growth marketing, visit hop.online. That's hop, H-O-P, dot online. Have a great day.